Welcome back, everyone, to Pontos Fathom Press. This is our podcast number 48, uh, Pontos Fathom Podcast, episode 48. Today we're going to talk about God, Emperor of Dune. Uh, we're going to talk about it in the context of Freud's Civilization, Its Discontents, and Lacan's uh, seminar from 1959-1960, his Ethics of Psychoanalysis, in which he kind of frames some of that civilization and discontents. And maybe in a way, uh, just like Lacan says civilization and discontents is Freud's ethics, maybe in a way God Emperor of Dune is Frank Herbert's ethics. Let's kind of ask the question, right? And and uh, it speaks to power. It speaks to a lot of things here. So uh, hopefully you guys will think this is interesting. We'll start off with The God Emperor of Dune. Uh, this is the fourth novel written by Frank Herbert. It's published in 1981. Uh, it, it follows the story of Dune, Dune Messiah and Children of Dune, uh, and, and builds on the concept of Muad'Dib's son, Leto II, uh, who has transformed himself into a giant sandworm, and he's become like the tyrant god of the known universe. And this takes place about 2,000 years, I'd say, after the Dune of those first Dune books. Um, and what's interesting about it, it's, it's, it's very interesting because you see the um, relation of, you know, Muad'Dib has, had become the Messiah figure, right? He led the Jihad. And then um, uh, you see in Dune Messiah, that sort of gets inverted, where he decides he wants to give up that power in a way, or he's created a monster. Uh, and he's not comfortable with the future prescience that he sees where all roads lead to um, maybe the end of humanity. Like the, the fact that he's given this kind of almost fascist um, cult power, uh, he rejects that. But what's interesting about Leto II is Leto II um, takes on this idea of he will become... It's almost the opposite of a space, safe space, right? Instead of making safe spaces, he will become the ultimate tyrant of humanity by transforming himself into an immortal sandworm that has full prescience of all the future and total ancestral memory of all the past. And from that position, he will help to elevate humanity's will to improve itself, right? So it's not like a nurturing environment. It's the total opposite. It's like, I will create conditions in the empire that a, a, a privileged class cannot benefit from. All classes shall be unprivileged. And in the result, something miraculous will happen is sort of his hope. But it's also sort of a story of power, sacrifice, absolute rule. And also the way that that can be manipulated, right? So like the the weakness and the underclass manipulate later. We'll kind of talk about some of that. Uh, uh, you know, in Freud's Civilization Discontents, the reason why I picked these two books is Lacan kind of points out to Civilization Discontents as Freud's ethics. And maybe in a way, God or Emperor of Dune is Frank Herbert's ethics, right? So we'll kind of deep dive into the ethics of psychoanalysis and um, civilization and discontents. So Civilization and Its Discontents was written uh, by Freud, published in 1930. And he goes into the tensions between civilization and individuals' instincts and desires. So sort of like the topic is a, somewhat about uh, civilization took, took care of all of these instinctual problems we had. Like, you know, for example... Uh, we don't hunt for food. We don't have to worry about shelter. We don't have to worry about employment. Civilization kind of takes up this mantle of all of these needs of humans. And, and in a way, all of those base needs, you know, when you're hungry, you need to eat, when you're thirsty, you need to drink, you know, all those urges are instinctive. The one urge that gets created out of society, though, is a kind of anxiety, right? So anxiety comes out of civilization because suddenly... Um, we're in a different position in relation to our instincts and our desires and our urges in, in comparison to what society expects of us, right? So this tension, he kind of, he kind of discusses various topics like the origins of human aggression. Uh, he talks about the guilt of, uh, 
of shaping civilization and the way that civilization represses primal urges, right? And so if you kind of look at this in the, in, in the sense of Dune, for example, the Bene Gesserit would always employ this tactic where they would manipulate people's urge for religion. And at the same time, there was a real Messiah. So kind of like it doubles the effect, right? This is what their unconsequent, the, um, they're unconsequent. They were not able to predict that power of Muad'Dib. They thought that he would just be something they could control, but they were wrong. All right, so Freud also reflects on like the possibilities of what does it mean to have happiness and fulfillment with you know in civilization, given these discontents, given these inherent conflicts between societal pressures and uh, let's say those instinctive urges, aggression and desires, right? Then if we t shift over, you know, the reading of, of Freud by Lacan in the Ethics of Psychoanalysis. This is a series of lectures that he gave in the 1959-1960 seminar. And he really looks at the idea of desire and ethics in the framework of psychoanalysis, right? So here he, t he, he looks at the complexities of desire, uh, what's the role of desire in human subjectivity, and how that intersects with morality and social order. And it sort of, um, it emphasizes, I'd say, a kind of an un unconscious, it's in, like sort of the unconscious aspects of desire. And what are those ethical implications of, of um, exploring these unconscious desires and navigating these hidden drives? And, and in a way, like, I think that Frank Herbert as a writer, although he's a Jungian, I think he does have this strong ethics. And I think what he uses the God Emperor for, and what we'll kind of explore here is, actually how weak the God Emperor is and how isolated he is and how lonely he is. And at the same time, how his golden path that he has for humanity is the way to save humanity from sort of a nihilism by, by forcing it to improve. You know, Herbert always has these themes of sort of humans can overcome. Like the example of, uh, the, in the Dune saga in general, they have the Butlerian Jihad, which is against thinking machines, which caused humans to take on the role of computing, right? This is where the mentats come from, right? So the idea of pushing humans beyond their limits. You know, there used to be a thing, I always thought about when I read Dune about the Bene Gesserit's improvements that they made. You know, their sort of, their ability to modulate their own body temperature. They could choose the gender of their child in, in utero, right? It's totally against the way people think of things now. They were able to use their voice to command. They were able to have ancestral memories. They could remember all their genetic line all the way back through time. So we sort of are living in an, in an anti-history -his age, right? We're going through this patch where people want us to feel freed from history. But we're not freed from history. We're tied to our genomic origins. We're tied to our civilization origins. And I think the knowledge of that is something that Herbert really uh, found uh, awful and awe-inspiring at the same time. So, you know, let's kind of mix it up a little bit, kind of integrate these concepts from the three books. So let's take God Emperor Dune, Civilization as Discontents, and Lacan, and sort of ex explore some of these connections, some of these intersections. So maybe we'll start back again with God Emperor of Dune. I think... When Leto starts out his role as a, the absolute ruler, he, he, he embodies immense power, right? And he embodies immense control. He actually merges with the sandworm, which is the producer of spice, which controls the entire universe. So the sake of his grandfather, Leto, from Dune, he was just trying to manage the planet that produces spice by managing the worms. The Harkonnens had managed the worms. But the melange causes the Bene Gesserit to awaken their ancestral memories. The melange causes the spacing guild, mutated guild navigators to fold space for intergalactic travel. It helps the Mentats. It powers the Bene Tlalax, right? So all, all roads lead to spice in the Dune universe. And yet Leto merges with the worm. So he doesn't just control the production of it. He becomes the worm itself, right? And this sort of... Uh, kind of ties in a bit to Freud's exploration of uh, the civilization. 
and like you say, like the repression of the individual's instinct. So by Leto transforming into a giant sandworm, that's almost like a metaphor of the loss of individuality and sacrifice requ- required to say, um, to maintain uh, order within the civilization, right? So he almost gives up his individuality. And in a way you think of Leto, he talks about himself Imagine if you could predict all the future and know all your ancestral past. Not just his mother's memories, like the Bene Gesserit, but also his, the, 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 the male side of his memories. So he's literally a, a strange, has a strange relationship to time, right? Um, and there's a, there's a lot of sacrifice this because his humanity is still within him and that humanity gets exploited. And we'll talk a little bit about that with uh, the reason why he keeps Duncan Idaho golas around and the reason why Hui Nori is brought in by the Ixians to sort of manipulate him, right? So if we go from, um, let's go into Freud's, you know, if, we, if, if Freud, Freud raises the question about the price of civilization, right? As individuals have to suppress their primal desires and instincts for the greater good of society, Right? But Leto, as the god emperor, he, he also sacrifices his personal freedom for the sake of preserving humanity's future. Right? So he actually takes on power in a way to cause individuals to rise up and be more powerful and more cognizant of their place in, 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 the, in the society. And this is how he, he, he seeks to preserve the empire by eventually having the empire destroyed. So Freud and Herbert highlight this conflict and tension between the struggle of the individual desire and the societal expectation, let's say, right? And if we move to Lacan, so if we bring a Lacan into the mix, uh, so there's a psychological dimension to power and desire, right? So for, for Lacan, maybe he's uncovering, uh, or the, he'll, he's speaking of the act of uncovering the unconscious desire and the recognizing of ethical choices in that uncovering, uncovering, right? So think of Leto. Leto's position, he's the ruler of all of the universe. And this raises a huge question about, say, the, uh, the nature, what is the ethical implications of wielding that much power? But in the same time, Leto is acting like, and we'll go into this in a bit, he's acting a bit like Lacan's... Um, Big other, his objet a, not the petit objet a, but the, the, the big other, right? So he's almost positing himself as a, I mean, he calls himself a god. And he's taken the Bene Gesserit sort of lesson of installing religions. And he's made himself not just, not just the prophet like Muad'Dib is, but he actually has made himself into the living god emperor, which is just horrifying, right? It's horrifying, right? And I think for, um, you know, for... This ethical, what's the ethics of this? Like Leto's position, uh, uh, we think it from Lacan's ideas, you know, it's almost like what's Leto's internal struggle and what are the consequences of his action? Because he's almost ego inflated so that he is the everyone's objet a. And then everything he lives in fears is also going to be, I want to say, digested by the society that he's created in the wake of his subjugation of it, right? It's very powerful stuff that Herbert is exploring here, right? So we're really going to try to delve into these these ethical implications of power, of desire. And, you know, if we look at how Leto, as God Emperor, he reflects on the challenges of society, but he also takes on those sacrifices to maintain that stability, and also to unlock inside of every human a potential, the underpinnings of desire. This is what, I mean, Jung would kind of call this um, individuation. But what's that, what's the role of, uh, say, shadow work or individuation in the impact of that in your ethical decision making? So if we go, we go back to the books before um, God Emperor, we think of Dune Messiah, right? So let's think about the father in all of this, right? The father of this. So Leto II's father is Paul Muad'Dib from Dune. And in Dune Messiah, the second book of Dune, uh, you really see how Paul 
Paul Atreides has risen to the power, risen to power as, as Muad'Dib. He's become a messiah figure. And although he sort of tried to manipulate the universe to his vision, he's dethroned the emperor, he's liberated the Fremen, right? Uh, the Fremen have gone across the universe in his jihad in his name, right? Uh, he ultimately, Paul ultimately finds himself trapped in this Muad'Dib construct, this persona that he's created, right? It almost has a life separate from himself. And we see this is that importance of uh, Ch Chani in his relationship. Like, she's the only one. Oh, I mean, I think Irulan has a point in this, too, where I think, uh, but Chani is sort of like the one who retains, helps him retain his humanity, right? And this is the consequence of his, action, of his, of his actions, right? So he's sort of, um, his prescient abilities, plus you, you, you um, couple that with the, all of the political and religious forces at work in the Dune universe, and it's sort of he realizes that there's a all the roads are leading to a future that he didn't anticipate and he doesn't desire. It, right? So Paul's failure comes out in here, right? Where his inability to escape to escape the path that he's laid out for himself, and even though he has all this power, that path he laid out has created a limitations by virtue of his own actions. Okay, so he's fulfilled this role of Quitsat Hadarak, but. What all he finds is limitation and entrappedness, right? Dead ends. Now, in contrast, his son, Leto II, as we see in, in, in Children of Doom, he sort of rises up to realize that he faces, you know, as a guy, as for Leto II, he faces a similar crossroads. And it all kind of goes back to the grandfather, right? Leto the one was at a crossroads. He knew that he was stepping into it when he took over. Um, uh, Arrakis but he did it with a sense of duty, loyalty and fairness, he was fair to the Fremen he tried to be fair to um, the political situation but he had all the cards stacked against him, it was a setup right, it was a setup now in contrast, Leto II suffers uh, neither of the um, well, has learned from the mistakes of both the grandfather and the father right and he comes up with a similar crossroad, but he makes a different choice. So Leto recognizes these pitfalls of absolute power, and he's going to try to avoid the mistakes that his father made, right? So Leto II wants to avoid the pitfalls of absolute power. So by transforming himself into the giant sandworm, he will become absolute power but with a very specific intention in mind, right? He will become absolute power and make humanity by being under his boot evolve into something more powerful, right? And he's going to be the ruler of the universe for thousands of years. So this decision allows himself to establish a stability and to protect humanity for the like for the future calamities to come, I, and this is kind of like where Herbert has sort of lifted from Asimov's foundation, right? Asimov's foundation kind of has this, and we'll kind of we'll kind of go into that a little bit, right? But but, but I think with the ethics here is, uh, Leto sacrifices his individuality because he believes it's necessary. It's a necessary trade off for the greater good. So so I think you can kind of see that contrast between Muad'Dib's failure with power and then on the other hand this later the seconds this weight and responsibility now we can almost see the god emperor as a stand-in for civilization right so it's almost like the, the, by becoming a low you know think of leviathan right civilization is like leviathan so the idea here is it's bigger than all of us like we you know you, you know it's i i kind of think for me it was like you know say if you you, you move to the big city right you move to the city right a lot, of, you know, a lot of kids want to move to the city, right? They grow up, they move to the city, and then suddenly you realize, oh, the city is way bigger than you. Everything goes on in the big city, right? You can find all different aspects. But in the end, we tend to have local neighborhoods. We tend to localize still in the big city. And yet the city is bigger than all of us. That's the civilization forces at work. And, and, and Leto decides to become the city, right? He becomes that, right? So if we go into Freud, right? let's think about Freud's commentary and how it kind of applies to these choices made by Muad'Dib and then by Leto II, by the God Emperor. Right, so 
Freud argues this idea that uh, individuals repress their innate instincts when they're in civilization, right? So civilization has stability, has rules, there's a social order, and some of this requires us to follow the law and follow the social rule as opposed to following instinct. And this is where that anxiety piece comes in with, with Freud, right? And I think you could see Mwadib had this anxiety, right? Sort of like, what have I done, right? This is what have I done, right? Um, so in the context of Mwadib and of Leto, we can kind of think about what are their attempts to reconcile their personal desires with the demands of the civilization at large, right? There's empire that's out there that needs to be ruled. So even though Mwadib has successes, he becomes, I would say, like disillusioned. Or the burden of his choice is actually a constraint upon him. The burden of becoming the Messiah is actually a constraint because he finds that the future isn't predictable now. By being that Messiah, he's also signing kind of a death warrant to the decline of civilization into like a fascism, something like this, right? The Muad'Dib's way is like declining into fascism, so he rejects it. But Leto takes it another level, right? Uh, Leto takes it another level and, and says, how can I escape the predetermined path, right? So with, with, with civilization and its discontents, you know, Freud highlights those internal conflicts and tensions when the individual suppresses their desire in service of society, right? If we go over to Lacan now in the ethics side of, of psychoanalysis, you can kind of see that there's a, uh, there's, let's, there's a lot, lot of, um, let's say, motivations and dynamics uh, in a psychological dimension to uh, Muad'Dib and later the second's choices, right? So they each have these, made these choices. So if we think about it, un like uh, in a way, the Lacanian um, uncovering of unconscious desire, or even Freudian, you know, Freudian al analysis. So say psychoanalysis is almost like a, uh, the metaphor for this in the Frank Herbert world is ancestral memories, right? Muad'Dib and um, Leto both have unlocked, as, as do the Bene Gesserit, they unlock ancestral memories, which is sort of analogous to psychoanalysis, right? So they, they are suffering from the burden of in, becoming in tune with their genomic and uh, psychological uh, unconscious and surfacing that unconscious uh, has some challenges. You know, there's a great, uh, in the, in the, in, in Dune Messiah and Leto, there's a great character, Alia, who kind of represents this, uh, the, the dangers of, psych let's say, the, the dangers of, of the unconscious emerging without proper care, let's say, because she becomes possessed by the inner memories of Harkonnen, which is kind of, that's a whole other topic. We could do a, a section on that uh, in and of itself. I don't want to stray to that one, but it's interesting, right? So this is like sort of like the, the risks of some of this... Um, uh, raising up the unconscious and recognizing the influence, right? So, so if we look at it through a Lacanian lens, let's say, we can see that there's ethical and there's ethical implications in this knowing of their desires and this fulfilling of their role, right? So Mahdib's failure is like an unconscious effect that influences his decision-making process. And I think for Leto, in, in Leto's case, we're kind of going to go deeper with God Emperor because with Leto, we see that he's subjecting himself to um, this inflation, to the uh, big A, the big other object. And we'll kind of see how that, how, um, maybe if we, we approach, um, if we approach the God Emperor of Dune as would, say, a Lacanian analyst, right? So imagine... Uh, imagine like a Lacanian concept like lack, right? So Lacan talks a lot about lack. So the idea of lack here is, um, um, so Lacan, Lacan talks about lack uh, that resolves, revolves around this idea of that the human desire is driven by a sense of incompleteness 
or by a sense of perceived absence, right? And this is what lack is. So it's like you want to fill the lack, right? But also lack in and of itself, and Freud also talks about lack. You know, it's sort of like the, um, we've talked here in past podcasts about the, the butcher's wife, right? Uh, that Freudian story about how it's like the lack itself is what you can desire, right? Because once you get, this is where buyer's remorse comes in, right? You get something and then you realize what you really l- loved was the desire of not having it more than the desire of having it, something like this, right? So when you can know all the futures, Muad'Dib's trap was set by himself, right? And Leto makes himself the trap in a way, right? So, so lack is sort of an in- inherent part of the human condition, and it's o- almost wholly pre-linguistic and pre-symbolic, right? And I think by Leto evolving, but also devolving into a worm, and ultimately when we get to heretics and chapter house, the Leto consciousness has been pushed down, planted like a seed deep in the unconscious so that it can emerge later. This is very, very, uh, very, very poetic work and very, very deeply psychologically in tuned work by Frank Herbert, right? So when Leto transforms into the giant sandworm and then he becomes the ruler as the god emperor, you can see this, let's try to frame this, um, Let's frame this as a response to his own sense of lack, okay? So he embodies power. But he's attempting to fill a void within himself, right? He's he's compensating for a perceived incompleteness, right? He's unable to steer the empire. So what he does is he makes the empire like his unconscious. And therefore he subjects himself to his sort of his his desire to control and stabilize this deep seated lack that he has. Right? Because he wants to overcome the inherent lack and the inherent vulnerability that's in the human condition, right? So he sort of like recognizes lack in all of humanity. And he somehow comes up with a plan. It's just very, it's very mind boggling, right? So, you know, I'd say in addition to this, like he, as he becomes, as Leto II becomes the God Emperor, he's ruling mankind for thousands of years. And sort of he does achieve this kind of immortality, but what it really becomes is it's a waiting game for him. It's a lonely waiting game for someone to overthrow him, right? He's waiting for them to be strong enough to overthrow him, right? So he's defying his own mortality and his limitations and his own humanity to give humanity a fighting chance to be better than they are. So it's the absolute opposite of coddling people, right? So it's like, it's almost like Herbert predicted this sort of snowflake problem, right? The idea of like everything was, he's like, no, nothing is, in, nothing is precious unless you fight for it. Nothing, nothing, is, nothing is, worth the, is worth the comfort of a tyrannically run empire. So you need to find it within yourself to reconcile this. And you have these actors that come up in Dune Revenant, these supporting characters that fully inter- interact with, you know, not only part of um, Leto's legacy, let's say, but also with the idea of how creatively his opponents try to chip away at him. And, and, and one of these, uh, two of these characters I, I mentioned is, is the Duncan Idaho character, and the other one is Tui Nori, who's in, in, genetically engineered to be everything the God Emperor's humanity would desire, but also to draw awareness to his inhuman state now and to fill him with even more sadness, right? This is kind of like fascinating stuff, right? So, so let's go, to, to wrap up the Lacan thing, let's just think of Lacan's lens, lack lens is a lens that we can understand later the second's motivations, right? And the sort of psychological underpinnings of his choice, right? So. He's overcome his own sense of lack and vulnerability. But then that same attempt to fill the lack, he's become trapped 
by power and even more isolated, right? He's super isolated. It's like the, it's like the, um, you know, the dictator in his circle, right? So maybe we could talk a little about, about Hui Nori, right? So Hui Nori is, uh, is a character that's kind of intro introduced as a, the way the political enemies of Leto are trying to chip away. You can't stop him. He knows all the future. He knows all the past. He controls the spice. He is the worm. He is Arrakis, right? He's the, he's the emperor of the known universe. He sets the allotment of melange that groups d get. I think at one point, I remember for hundreds of years, he denied the Bene Gesserit all but a small amount of spice because of, they displeased him. So you displease him, your organization, your planet gets reduced rations for 10 generations, right? This is the God Emperor, right? So how do you combat him, right? So, so, so to Leto's desire of, of mankind overcoming him, well, what the Tlilaxu do uh, is introduce Hui Nori. So she's, so first off, Hui Nori is, uh, has been designed and created by the Tlilaxu. She's been grown in their, in their null entropy axolotl tanks or whatever. She's, uh, she's engineered to be physically and intellectually alluring to Leto, right? And the, the Tlilaxu are seeking to manipulate Leto his desire, his longing for his lost humanity, for his lack of companionship. I mean, Leto has kept alive um, the Atreides bloodline for his own kind of Bene Gesserit plan. He has Moneo around, but Moneo is more like a, a butler for him. He just understands the Jekyll and Hyde nature of Leto as the god emperor because he suffers from these turns that he has. You know, he sort of has a Jekyll and Hyde kind of as the worm instinctive starts to overcome his humanity, he wrestles with this all the time. So there is kind of like a caretaker in Moneo. But with Hui, uh, she's definitely introduced as that for his longing of companionship and also um, maybe a, to be a match for him to exploit his, his lack and also for his yearning for, to be human, right? So he's given up this humanity, but he still has that yearning inside of himself. But also, Hui is very, um, she's very challenging to him too. Like her presence is, makes it difficult to, for Leto to uh, keep his stoic resolve, right? So he's kind of made this stoic resolve for thousands of years, this self-imposed isolation. Like he will help mankind advance at the sacrifice of his own self. But she humanizes him, and it's sort of like it's not, he's not able to, because she evokes emotion out of him, it makes him question uh, the implications of this absolute power, right? So she represents maybe the lost opportunity of Leto for love. Like he hasn't had this love. He has ancestral memories of his father and mother's love. You know, Paul and Cheney had true love, right? But he's never had this, right? So he's, he, he has a yearning for love. He's vulnerable, right? He, has, he yearns for intimacy, right? And all of these aspects that he's distanced himself from as part of his grand design, with the introduction of Hui into his life, the Tlilaxu are trying to manipulate this lack by presenting him with a possibility, Right, the possibility of filling the void that's within him. Right, this genuine human connection, the tyrant and this um, companion. Right. So they they're using this to try to destabilize him. Right, if they can destabilize his iron grip by making him waver, falter, humanize him they can potentially compromise his reign. So it's a Tlilaxu Trojan horse in the form of a person, right? A friend as a Trojan horse, right? It's amazing, right? Uh, so it's important to note that while she may represents manipulation, her, her actual personal uh, inspiration, she actually quite admires and is interested in Leto. 
she's actually very sincere. It's like she's not in on the joke, right? The Tlilaxo are using her, and she's also somewhat aware of that she is a pawn in this, and she's also caring for Leto, which makes it even worse, right? So now Leto, like you have a, a double agent, right? Who knows they're a double agent, but she actually likes Leto. And now it's even more complex, right? So her existence in their relationship uh, brings these kind of unforeseen challenges to Leto. And so his kind of re reconnecting to his humanity, his reconnecting to this vulnerability, uh, forces him to, I, I want to say, confront his humanity and the um, maybe the limitations of his grand plan. It's like he almost needs to be, and I think this is what the book ends up being, is where he needs to be taken out in order for his plan to work. Uh, so yeah, I think she's a cool catalyst in, in the story, right? She, and she also shows like some real growth and, and, and the way that Leto um, uh, is a tragic figure. He's really a tragic figure. You know, he's such a tragic figure and he's such an isolated figure. Um, you know, if you think about the other character that's present in the... Um, God Emperor series, and that is the Golas of Duncan Idaho. So, in 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 Dune Messiah, uh, we we see the first Duncan Idaho Gola. So a Gola is like a clone, right? So they clone Duncan Idaho, and you remember Paul is quite fond of Duncan, and then when Paul is gifted again by the Tlilaxu, when Paul is gifted with a clone of Duncan Idaho. He become he represents that friend that the prophet needs the friend, right? And I think that Leto, in knowing all of his father's memories, recognizes how important having that link was. You know, to have the Tulilaxo uh, realized that the god emperor needed a companion. And they could use that companion to manipulate him. But Leto realized that he also needed that um, almost uh, idolizing of the friend that Duncan Idaho represents and the admiration of him. So Leto decides to continue the Duncan Idaho cloning program. So he always has a gola of Duncan Idaho. And, and inadvertently, the Duncan Idahos always try to assassinate or kill Leto. So he's had him cloned hundreds and hundreds of times throughout the, th the couple thousand years. And he's also using Duncan Haido for, for another theme, which is he's using him as breeding back to the original Atreides line, right? So as the, as the human genome evolves over this time, he's using Duncan Idaho as part of his own breeding program. Much like the Bene Gesserit were using Jessica and the Harkonnens and the Atreides to breed their Quetzalcoatlrak. Um, Leto's doing a similar thing with Duncan. He's sort of like the control group. So from a so let's think of this from a Lacanian, from a Freudian perspective, right? So the idea of Duncan Haido, you've got these multiple Duncan Golas. And these are kind of like the objet petit a in, in, in Lacan, sort of the object cause of desire, right? So it's sort of a, in Lacanian theory, this object petit a is sort of the uh, idea of what's the focus of your desire or the subject's, say, like, where do you get fulfillment from? And because by Paul and then Leto II had a fondness for Duncan, they sort of serve as the, as the lost object for desire for the God Emperor, right? So Duncan becomes like the stand-in for the lost desire. And then he would, Duncan would also be inadvertently married into the Atreides bloodline as Duncan was working on sort of his own breeding program to breed the, the, the humans that could overthrow him, right? To, to make a stronger human. So the presence, and then there's the presence of Duncan Idaho. Just the presence of Duncan Idaho, Idaho is, you know, his trusted companion from the past, this nostalgic attachment, this link to his own personal history. Because imagine, imagine being later the second. What's your personal history? All your memories are your father's ancestral line and your mother's ancestral lines. 
and you've only lived a short time by yourself, like, you know, the, the, the events of um, the children of doom. And then you also can see all the futures. So his sense of grounding his personal life into the nostalgia, you can think of it like the Agent K's replicant memories in Blade Runner 2049 or, or Rachel's replicant memories, right? He wants to self um, replicate his own memories by keeping this nostalgia piece, this nostalgia friend by his side, right? So the recurring go golas, they fulfill Leto's desire to keep the memory of Duncan Idaho and to main, maintain, let's say like to maintain a connection to his past self and to his humanity. You know, so that, so if you take that maybe from Freud, a Freudian view, there's also something quite uncanny about the Duncan Idaho Golas, right? So it's the return of the repressed, right? So for Freud, he talks about the uncanny as something that's simultaneously familiar and unfamiliar. You know, we talk about uh, the uncanny value, va valley. We talk about the uncanny valley in um, um, uh, computer graphics. You know, when they were, you know, like the... Um, when, you know, like sort of like the cats thing, it's something weird, right? That that place where you kind of look human, but it doesn't look human. You know, the human eye is so, so has ancestrally, genomically, from our time of um, evolution, we've developed such an eye to find out if it's a real human or if it's some kind of fake human, right? And that when we see graphic computer graphics and it's something's wrong with the eye or the lips or the face or the twitch, we really notice it. And it's uncanny. Well, for Freud, Freud, you know, 1930s say, right? Freud's perspective, the uncanny valley is just the uncanny. And it's sort of like that simultaneity of the familiar and the unfamiliar. So it's something unease, an unease is created in the uncanny. A, a, a discomfort is created by the uncanny. Right, something that puts you at arm's length. So this reappearance of Duncan Idaho in different bodies, it triggers a sense of the uncanny, right? So each one that returns, like Leto says, the Duncans, in his own internal mo monologue, he'll also say, the Duncans always rebel in the end, right? Because it's the nature of Duncan Idaho to rebel against injustice. And Leto represents the ultimate injustice. And every time he has a Duncan Gola, He's going to rebel against him because his Atreides loyalty cannot stand for a tyrant like God Emperor. So he keeps Duncan around in this uncanny way, right? It just sort of triggers the sense of the uncanny, and it reminds it reminds the character. It's like reminding us of the characters from Leto's past, but it also introduces this disconcerting element of of control and uncontrol familiar and unfamiliar. So um, there's also kind of a, a, a Freudian a repetition compulsion, sort of a, 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 a neurosis of the Duncan's returning, right? So it's like Leto has this kind of neurotic behavior to bring the Duncan's back, right? So it's just like an obsessive compulsive, right? So this repetition compulsive on Leto's part, he wants to repeat the past experience over and over and over. So what he's doing, it's almost like, but in Leto's kind of view, he, he realizes that he's doing it. And he's doing it almost like folding layers of Damascus steel, right? He's folding the samurai sword. He brings the Duncan back. He brings back another Duncan. He makes a variation. He brings one back. Um, the, the life spin, they live to old age. They die trying to assassinate him. He brings one back, right? So this tendency to repeat the past experience or the past pattern allows Leto to almost fine-tune what this experience is, right? So this um, pattern of behavior in normal human life, you know, think of normal patterns of behavior where we have repetition, uh, compulsion. There's usually some kind of uh, initial trauma or, or something unpleasant and that the compulsion repeats that, right? So the repeated creation of Duncan by the you know resurrecting of these Duncan Golas, kind of reflects this subconscious desire to revisit and resolve past traumas over and over again. Maybe it's in a way 
you know, Leto's revisiting Duncan's loyalty. He's testing Duncan's loyalty. He's testing Duncan's ability to die for humanity, right? He's trying to create the hero against the god, right? And each time, so you know, some of the Duncans actually live to an old age, you know? Some of the Duncans don't. And it's, and it's sort of like he kind of plays this thing out over and over again. So the goal existence kind of raises this question also about identity, memory, the unconscious. As each different gola also starts to collect fragments of their past lives. So the odd byproduct that gets explored in Heretics and Chapter House, right, is that actually just like the Bene Gesserit Quitsat Haderach program and the Bene Gesserit um, Reverend Mother program allows them to unlock ancestral memories. The Duncans, these subsequent clones of Duncan Idaho, begin to retain some of the memories of their past lives. And Heretics of Dune and Chapter House Dune, they really go into this, uh, where they, um, the, the Golas play a, a, a huge role in the idea of uh, bringing out these ideas of, of what it means to be human, um, what is the nature of memory? What is the desire over these generations? And, and then eventually they become prescient in, the, in and of themselves. They remember all the memories of the, of the Golas. So it's like um, this signifying chain kind of like, it's almost like, you know, there's something like Freud, I think Freud talked about schizophrenia could jump five generations where you like, you'll have somebody who is, and then their daughter isn't, but she lived with her mother who was. And then her granddaughter hears the stories of that, but she... The signs disappear. And then her daughter no, not only has no experience of it, she has no stories of it. And then the next generation, you might see it occur. Like something weird like this, right? The idea that there's a, a timeline being played out. And I think Leto got insights into this timeline, right? So uh, maybe like, you know, the Duncan Idaho goal, goal, goals are sort of like this objet petit a. They're also these objects of desire. They're uncanny, um, they're kind of a symbol of repetition compulsion, and they're also a symbol of you know, nostalgia, identity, memory. Right? So you can really see how rich God Emperor of Dune like, approaches these. And this is why, you know, going back to that idea that it's, a, it, that it's a ethics, because you start to see how Frank Herbert uses this medium as talking about what, what's important about our time here on Earth, what's important about humanity. And he sort of starts to focus on some of these things, learning from mistakes, right? Um, we think about a bit, if we think about Harry Seldon, for example, he has a similar plight, uh, Harry Seldon in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Asimov Foundation. He also has this goal to save humanity, right? He, he establishes um, psychohistory. He realizes that um, in the long run, there's going to be a dark ages of humanity. But by collecting this Encyclopedia Galactica, they will um, reduce the length of the Dark Ages. So those similar themes are explored in both of the books, right? Leto's transformation into the worm and into his absolute role is a similar, like, safeguarding, like the Harry Seldon project. Uh, you know, so you see in uh, Leto's actions are rooted in, like, this idea of uh, history, ecology, genetic preservation, shaping humanity's evolution, steering it away from self-destructive patterns, building some... Uh, using this huge management of power and control to ultimately prevent the collapse of humanity by making stronger and more integrated humans, more deeply integrated humans, like humans who have survived this lesson, right? Harry Seldon's psychohistory plan is sort of based on that um, similar kind of, it's a statistical version of this story, right? So his statistics will show that he wants to be a guiding force for humanity's inevitable dark age, and to quicken, to lessen the duration of that impending dark age. Right? So they both have this long vision term for humanity, but their approach is very much different. Like Leto decides to self-sacrifice, become this god emperor to push uh, humanity uh, forward. Where Harry Seldon uh, seeks to manipulate politics and economics and, 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 and education, let's say. You know, something like this, right? Right, so, so the other role is how Leto is sort of, I, I mentioned earlier, but he kind of embodies this Lacanian concept of the big other, right? So he, he wields this immense power. He has control over the universe. He's establishing this um, 
rigid order, the stability. So he positions himself as this ultimate authority, which kind of like is what Lacan positions, the symbolic big A, the, the big other, is also the dominant social and political structure in a way, right? So this is, in a way, civilization discontents kind of overlap in this idea of the big A, right? So the big other. So in Leto's desire to sort of reshape humanity, you know, he's manipulating society, but he's acting kind of as um, the ultimate worst thing. Like he sort of like becomes a demiurge in a Gnostic kind of way. And this is why he, he's trying to do it to um, uh, shape the evolution of humanity. I'll kind of say it like that, right? So maybe wrapping it up, like, uh, you know, this is probably a good place to stop. I think, um, you know, uh, you know, we've kind of done a little tour on this. Hope this was interesting for everybody. You know, so, you know, Freud kind of brings that civilization discontents with these tensions between the individual desire and the, uh, and the societal de um, power. And we saw how Leto kind of fits in this as the giant sandworm. He's sort of like the sacrificial lamb in a way uh, by the end of the book. He sort of becomes the sacrificial, it's a very Christ-like figure, right? Uh, and his idea for the societal order he's going to impose this kind of um, totalitarianism. So only that so people can rebel against it, right? So he, he's curbed the instincts for the greater good of society, right? And then for, with, from a Lacanian point of view, we've talked about lack. We've talked about Leto's motivations and his desires, his vulnerability to the human condition, you know, his need for Hui Nori and, and Duncan to sort of like either be manipulated by his humanity or to stay in touch with his humanity. And overall, like his, his, his pursuit of stability for mankind leads to this kind of isolation um, and a loss of personal freedom. So it sort of highlights the tragic consequences of uh, attempting to overcome lack, right? You have a tragic consequence if you uh, um, try to overcome it, right? So hopefully this was interesting for you guys. Um, we know we, we, we took God Emperor, we sliced it and diced it as an ethics with Frank Herbert, explored a little Lacan, Lacanian and Freudian topics. Uh, if you guys have made it this far, really appreciate it. Uh, if you like what we're doing here, you can go check out our bookstore. We're going to start turning some of our podcasts into uh, a book series. Uh, first one out is the Jungian Horror and Science Fiction and Alchemy, where we talk about Frank Herbert. We've also got the Alchemy of Azathoth, Necromancy of Neolethotep, Hermeticism of Hastor. If you're into the Cthulhu disclosure from the Necronomicon fragments, go check those out in our links below. You can also check out our Patreon. We explore some more of these topics in um, the fan fiction Dune Revenant. Um, in Dune Revenant, it sort of um, continues an alternate view of uh, the future of the Dune saga. So... Um, you know, maybe maybe quickly, like the idea here is uh, it's after the time of Leto. It's after God Emperor and um, Chapter House Dune. So what we introduce in Dune Revenant is, is the Muad'Dib Gola. And the idea of this is how does that influence Leto II's sec perception of himself. And now there's a relationship between Leto II's um, memories and this Muad'Dib Gola, which goes more into this confronting the mirror, the mirror self. Uh, the sense of identity, the sense of what is my role in this post post phase, and there's also an Oedipal complex here, right? So there's sort of like these uh, this loop of Moadibs and Leto the Second sort of reemerging, kind of has an Oedipal dynamic. So we kind of go into some of that. Maybe that'll be a podcast that you can go check out on our Patreon uh, for as little as a dollar. You can check out a lot of this content. So guys, thanks a lot for your support. Leave your comments below um, if you enjoyed it, like and subscribe, and we'll see you in the next one. I'll probably be doing. Uh, I, I want to go through Akira um, in, in the sense of uh, maybe four fundamental concepts and Akira in the sense of uh, Lacan's Ecri. I'm also thinking Ghost in the Shell in point of view of Lacan's television and his um, lecture on desire. And I also want to do a Zizek on science fiction. I put it off this week because I'm still working on some of the notes for that. So thanks a lot for your guys' support. Um, talk to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.